Hey guys, thanks for joining Baltimore County Fire Department uh, EMS uh, training series. Uh, for those who I haven't met, my name is Sean Barinholtz. I am an anesthesia and an ICU physician at Hopkins. I am an active volunteer in Pikesville Volunteer Fire Company in Baltimore County. And I have the honor of serving as one of the associate medical directors for Baltimore County Fire Department. On behalf of Dr. Andy Pollack in the medical director's office, on behalf of the EMS office, uh, the EMS training academy staff, and Captain Lenny Stewart. Thank you for what you guys do every day. Thank you for your dedication to lifelong learning. A shout out to Ashley Brooks. Ashley is a young member and volunteer at Pikesville uh, who helps us with the Zoom platform. Ashley is also the one who will be sending out a link uh, in the chat uh, sometime during this training. Uh, click on that link, enter some information, get your MIM CEU. So if you want your MIM CEUs, keep an eye on the chat. We'll announce it as well towards the end. Uh, click that link, uh, enter some basic information, and we will get you your CEUs. If you have questions about your CEUs, if you have questions about receipts for participation, uh, or if you have any problems signing in to the form in the chat, uh, please hang out with us after this training uh, to make sure that we resolve any and all of these issues and to make sure that you have what you need. Uh, we are not able to add people to the roster uh, after this training closes tonight. Uh, so super delighted to have with us Dr. Harlan uh, Hayeti. Dr. Hayeti is an associate DIO at Cook County Hospital. She's associate professor and chair of education, Department of Emergency Medicine, Cook County Hospital in Chicago, where she organizes the curriculum and educational activities for the 68 residents and 30 faculty in the department. She was named the 2019-20 Outstanding Speaker of the Year by American College of Emergency Physicians. She is involved in medical education research, has written numerous manuscripts and textbooks outside of work. She likes to run on days that her knees allow her to. She's an avid fan of crossword puzzles, reading, travel, and doing geometry homework with her 14-year-old. She's also pursuing her <laughs> Master's of Education, uh, I just learned at Hopkins. Dr. Hayeti, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we super appreciate what you do for us and for moving this needle of uh, medical education forward. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. And, and uh, thank you to all of you who are at home and spending your, your evening, at least a little bit of it, um, all together here. So I'm, I'm super happy to be joining you guys. I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen. All right. And so the, is that uh, popping up okay? Great, okay, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so this is a topic that is kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, one that uh, intimidated me early on in my career. Um, and so one that I wanted to tackle because uh, I hate that feeling of not understanding something and, and being intimidated by a subject. And so this became um, something that I did a deep dive into. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, complications of implanted devices. And specifically, I mean, there's lots of implanted devices, but we're going to focus specifically on pacemakers and um, the internal cardio um, verter and defibrillators. So I have no disclosures. I don't uh, make any money outside of the county of Cook. So the first thing I want to just kind of go through is a little bit of a nomenclature with these pacemakers. And pacemakers are very sophisticated, smart devices, but we can dumb them down a little bit just so that we can understand them better. Because when things get overly complicated, I get lost. And so what we really need to understand is what, what is the pacemaker capable of doing? The pacemaker can obviously one pace. Um, and it's, it's in, in its name. Um, so what that means is it can essentially kind of take the place of the native cardiac rhythm and boss the heart around and tell it what to do. And so that's, it paces. The number two thing it can do is it can sense things. And when we talk about pacemaker sensing or the defibrillators sensing things, it means that it's looking out for rhythms. It's checking, it's running surveillance on the heart and saying, are you working? What's your rhythm? Are you in sinus? Are you not in sinus? This VTAC, what's going on here? So it's always running surveillance. That's what sensing is. And then the last thing is the response. So the pacemaker or the ICD has to respond to what it sees. And so essentially we want the pacemaker in an ideal situation to 
be triggered to do something if it needs to be done, or if the heart's doing okay and doesn't really need the pacemaker or the ICD, we don't want it to be working. So we want the pacemaker or ICD to be inhibited, to inhibit itself and not do anything. And that'll help preserve the battery life of the device. Most of these devices last anywhere from five to 10 years, and it's 100% dependent on how often it's used, how often it's triggered. So we get into some of the nomenclature of these devices, and this used to confuse me a little bit um, in the beginning. There's essentially two types of pacemakers that you will most frequently encounter. And one is going to be a VVI, and the other one is going to be VDD. And so we're always like, what does this mean? What does VVI mean? What does DDD mean? So the first letter of these, these pacemaker letters tells you what is being paced, which chamber of the heart is being paced. And so in a VVI pacemaker, the right ventricle is being paced. So that first letter V tells you what's being paced, the ventricle. The second letter tells you what chamber is being sensed. So which chamber is the pacemaker running surveillance on? And in a VVI pacemaker, the second letter is a V. So the ventricle is being sensed. So the ventricle is being paced and the ventricle is being sensed. The I, so the third letter, you pretty much have either um, an I or a T. So it's either going to be inhibited or it's going to be triggered. And so in a VVI pacemaker, it has the ability to be inhibited. So what this means is the right ventricle is being paced, the right ventricle is being sensed, and it, the pacemaker has the ability to inhibit itself if it picks up normal cardiac activity. So it says, oh, you're good. I don't need to work. I'm just going to shut myself off here. So that's a VVI. Now, the reason we care about VVI is you know, in Baltimore, here in Chicago, these big, you know, metropolitan um, cities, the, we have a very diverse patient population, including patients who come from other countries. And so worldwide, the most common type of pacemaker is actually a VVI pacemaker. Now here in the States, the most common type of pacemaker that's implanted is going to be a DDD. And what a DDD pacemaker is, is it tells you that Dual, D stands for dual. So that means it's dual paced. That means there's two chambers that are actually being paced. Which chambers are those? It's the right atrium and the right ventricle. So two chambers being paced. So if you're gonna pace two chambers, ideally you wanna be able to sense or run surveillance on two chambers as well. So the right atrium and the right ventricle is also being sensed. And then the third letter D means it has a dual response. And what the dual response means is it has the ability to not only be inhibited if there's normal cardiac activity, but it also has the ability to be triggered in the absence of normal cardiac activity. So it can do both. If it runs surveillance and it sees normal cardiac activity, it says, okay, good, you're on your own and I'm just gonna shut off here. And if it runs surveillance and notices that there's not normal cardiac activity, it'll trigger itself to start working. So pretty ingenious little devices. Now, most, not most, all patients are handed one of these cards when they get a device. I will tell you that I have never seen one of these cards make its way into my emergency department. Like they are, the patients are told to put this in their wallet and they are supposed to, you know, walk around with this in their wallet or somewhere on them so that if somebody picks them up or they end up in the emergency department, we can identify what the device is and what was put in and what's going on and how old it is. This has never made its way into my emergency department. But in an ideal situation, you can see there's some really handy information here. So it tells you, you know, the manufacturer of the device. Um, it tells you when the device was implanted. Um, it tells you what the device is. So, you know, for example, in this example, I can see that there's a, um, a right ventricular lead and a right atrial lead. So I know I have a dual chambered pacemaker. There's two chambers that are being paced here. Most importantly, it's got the, uh, the phone a friend uh, information here. So the, the physician who placed the device along with their phone number. Um, and so that's really important information because then I can phone a friend and say, hey, your patient's um, bounced into my emergency apartment. Tell me what to do. So this is very handy and very helpful, but unfortunately doesn't always make its way um, to, uh, to the emergency department. We do have other ways of figuring out the device manufacturer. And the reason why we care about the manufacturer at all is because 
It tells us who we need to call if we need the device interrogated. And what that means is I can call someone in to come into the, to the ER and they can then kind of, they attach um, some monitors to the actual pacemaker or defibrillator and it downloads a ton of information about what is going on with the pacemaker. So depending on what the patient is complaining about, I can get some information based on that interrogation. And so I have to call someone in to do that for me. If I don't have that card or the patient doesn't have that card, what we will do is we will actually shoot a chest X-ray um, and we over penetrate the film, which basically means it's, it's not a standard chest X-ray, um, but with these digitized X-rays, I can then zoom in on the device and every single device has a little stamp on it that tells you who the manufacturer is. So for example, a Medtronic um, device here, you can see it's got this like super cool abstract um, looking M and it's stamped right there. So I can zoom in on that. I see that it's Medtronic. I can call the Medtronic um, rep. St. Jude Medical, it's got this kind of SJM, you can kind of make it out right there in the corner. And so now I know, okay, I need to call St. Jude and have them come in and interrogate this device. So if they don't have the card, not a big deal. We can usually figure it out. So before we launch into problems with pacemakers, it helps to identify what normal looks like. So what does a normal paced EKG or rhythm script look like? Because if I know what normal is, I can identify then abnormal. So this is a 12 lead EKG of, um, uh, of a patient who has a dual chambered pacemaker. How do I know? So here's lead two, and we're just going to look at this rhythm strip down at the bottom here. This right here, this is an atrial spike. So this is the, the little spike here tells me that this is an atrial spike. And then underneath it, you know, right after it, I mean, you have a, a P wave. So if you look at lead two here, here's your atrial spike and here's a P wave. And the P wave is going to have a normal morphology. It's just going to look like a regular P wave. After the atrial spike and the P wave, then you get this ventricular spike. So this spike here is a ventricular spike, and that's the spike that is activating the, the right ventricle. And then you get this QRS complex. And when you look at this EKG, you can see that, you know, on this rhythm strip down here, this is a pretty wide QRS. That's normal in a paced rhythm. So when the ventricle is being paced, the QRS is going to widen. And that is what we expect to see. So this is not concerning to us in any way. So I know I have a dual chambered pacemaker. I have an atrial spike. I have a P wave. I have a ventric ventricular spike. And then I get this wide QRS complex that follows it. And then you see you've got this normal T wave that follows afterwards. And so that all the way through, I see those two spikes, one right after the other. Okay. And so this looks beautiful. I'm very happy with this very normal paced EKG. Let's take a look at this one. So this was an EKG of a patient um, who came into our emergency department complaining of syncope. So um, she told us that she has a pacemaker. And when I take a look at this EKG, the first thing that stands out to me is I've got one, two, three, four, five QRS complexes in this 10 second strip. So in, this, so in a minute, that gives me a heart rate of about 30. So that's not normal. And in a patient who's got a pacemaker, the pacemakers are set to be triggered at a certain threshold. So typically that's going to be about 60 or 65. So if the patient drops below 60 or 65, that should trigger the pacemaker to start working. So the fact that this is not working is a problem. So why, why isn't this patient's pacemaker recognizing that, oh my God, this, this heart rate is 30, I need to be doing something in this, um, in this situation. When we take a closer look, now I'm gonna actually try to look at these P's and QRS complexes. So I see a P wave here, here's a QRS, and then I have a P here, and then there's kind of an empty space, and then another P, and then a QRS complex. This looks like it's a T wave. This is a P, and then what looks like a super long PR interval, and then you have a QRS complex. And so you can see that these Ps and these QRSs are really not marching out appropriately. And so when you sort of have this dissociation between the atrium and the ventricle, between the Ps and the QRSs, this is third degree heart block. So this patient's pacemaker is not working appropriately for whatever reason. 
So this is failure to pace. And this is going to be the most common problem you're going to run into with a pacemaker. So this is where the pacemaker just is not delivering the stimulus. And so you're basically not going to see pacer spikes. So you can take a look here as well. So what we've got here is this is a ventricular spike and then you've got a QRS complex here. So the patient generated their own normal P wave and then the pacemaker waits a certain amount of time for the QRS to come. If the QRS doesn't come, it says, okay, time for me to take over. And so it ran surveillance. It didn't see the QRS complex in time. And so it fires a ventricular spike. And then you get that ni nice wide QRS complex afterwards. Perfect. But then you have a P wave here. The pacemaker should have waited a certain amount of time and then not seen the QRS complex and fired away a ventricular spike, but it didn't do that. Again, so the atrium, this patient's sinus node is working beautifully. They're, they keep making these P waves. They keep making P waves. It's just, there's no more conduction after that. So they're not getting QRS complexes afterwards. And then somehow the pacemaker kind of regroups and then starts firing away ventricular spikes again. But something is going wrong here. And this is failure to pace. It's an example of failure to pace. This one is also interesting. So what we've got here is this is a patient who's got um, an atrial spike here, and then you can see there's a normal P wave. And then the patient's conduction system, after that P wave is generated, the rest of their conduction system was fine. And so they were able to make their own QRS complex. And you can see it's narrow and it looks very, very normal. Atrial spike again, here's a normal looking P wave, and then they were able to generate their own QRS complex. So this is a patient who's probably has a sinus node problem. So what they really just need is an atrial pacemaker because everything else after that is working just fine. Atrial uh, spike, normal P wave, here's your nice narrow QRS complex that the patient generated on their own. And then you can see that something happened here. Now there's no more atrial spike. So something went wrong with that atrial pacemaker and it's no longer generating atrial spikes. So this is failure to pace of the atrial pacemaker. And so then luckily for this patient, they all, they have a dual chambered pacemaker. So not only do they have a pacer lead in that right atrium, but there's one in that right ventricle. And what happened here is the right ventricle, that pacemaker lead is like, what's going on, you guys? We're not getting any P waves down here. We're gonna have to take over. And so then that's exactly what it does. The ventricular pacemaker starts firing. And so it's not gonna wait anymore for the atrial pacemaker. It, it knows there's something wrong. And so the ventricular pacemaker just takes over and starts generating these wide QRS complexes, okay? So patient's very fortunate. They have a dual chambered pacemaker. When that atrial lead failed, the, ventri the ventricular pacemaker was able to take over. So in this particular case, um, this was a failure to pace of the atrial pacemaker. Now, the most common cause of failure to pace is oversensing. And oversensing, a way to think about what oversensing is, is that the pacemaker gets overwhelmed. It gets overwhelmed by other signals. So most typically, the story you will get is the patient was at the gym and they were doing push-ups or they were doing sit-ups. And in the process of doing those push-ups or those sit-ups, the skeletal activity of the pectorals or their um, uh, you know, abdominal muscles, that those skeletal myopotentials, the, the energy of those skeletal muscles working confuses the pacemaker. And so the pacemaker thinks that those potentials coming from the pectoral muscles are being generated by the heart. And so it thinks, oh, you're making your own activity here in the heart. I'm just going to shut up and you don't need me. When in reality, it wasn't the heart doing that at all. It was the pectorals doing it. And so once the pacemaker then kind of shuts itself off in its confused state, the patient, if they're pacemaker de dependent, then they're no longer going to generate the QRS complexes they need. And what's going to happen? They're going to pass out. They're going to have a syncopal episode. They may develop chest pain or shortness of breath or whatever, whatever sort of the byproduct of their pacemaker not working is. Another cause of this can be hiccups. So, you know, that the diaphragm as it spasms during hiccups can confuse the pacemaker. And so the, you know, if you imagine the pacemaker lead in that right ventricle, it's sitting right on top of that diaphragm. And so it gets confused and it thinks the diaphragm spasming from the hiccups are um, QRS complexes. And so it shuts itself off, 
boom, the patient drops and syncopizes. Um, cell phones. So cell phones, some people like to put their cell phones right in their shirt pocket over their device. And that can also confuse the, um, the pacemaker as well and kind of scramble the signals. You've seen signs at the airport um, when you're going through security. So any electromagnetic fields can disrupt um, that pacemaker and cause oversensing and then failure to pace. Um, we do this sometimes in the emergency department when we go to intubate a patient and we will give succinylcholine. And when you push succinylcholine, you get these, you know, fasciculation. So the patient kind of starts to spasm a little bit. And in that process of the fasciculations of the muscles spasming, the pacemaker gets confused. It thinks that all those, those uh, spasms are coming from the heart. And so it will basically stop pacing, thinking that that's normal cardiac activity. So we try not to use succinylcholine when we're intubating pacemaker patients. So this is going to be your most common cause of failure to pace. Now, how do we treat this? With a magnet. And so this is usually the, the biggest challenge in our emergency department is finding a magnet. Um, and so we have now um, done a good deed. We put it in our Pixis um, and you can see it's labeled here, cardiac magnet. Um, and it's always in there and we know exactly where to find it. So what does a magnet do with a pacemaker? So when you put the magnet on the pacemaker, it sets the pacer function to asynchronous mode. And what asynchronous mode means is it turns the sensing function off of the pacer. When you turn the sensing function of the pacer off, you're telling it to stop running surveillance. And if it's no longer running surveillance, it doesn't really have the ability to get triggered or inhibited. So essentially it's just gonna pace. So by putting a magnet on a pacemaker, it tells the pacer just start pacing. And so that's what happens when you have failure to pace. If you don't see those spikes, put that magnet on and it should turn that pacemaker on and get it going again. This is a great example of uh, what happens when you put a magnet on. So this is a patient who's got a dual chambered pacemaker. Um, and so they are making their own P wave here. And then the QRS complex doesn't come in time. So the ventricular um, lead goes, that goes and spikes here. And you see this nice wide QRS complex that follows immediately. Here's another, here's a normal P wave that the patient generated on their own. And then the ventricular spike fires. And then you get this wide QRS complex. When they put that magnet on, the atrial pacemaker wasn't working before because it didn't need to work. The patient was making their own P waves. But when you put the magnet on, you tell the pacemaker to stop sensing, to stop running surveillance, to stop looking for stuff and just to start pacing. And so then now you've fired up that atrial pacemaker, ventricular pacemaker, atrial pacemaker, ventricular pacemaker. So now everything is just firing the way it would if it, you know, if it needed to all the time. So that's what a magnet is going to do in a pacemaker. When do we use magnets um, on pacemakers? Basically, if you have a patient who is abnormally bradycardic, you want to get the magnet on the pacemaker. Again, a patient with a pacemaker's heart rate is never going to drop below 60. It shouldn't because the pacemaker is set to fire at below 60. And if you see failure to pace, so if if a patient has a pacemaker and their heart rate is 30, like the EKG we saw earlier, and there's no pacer spikes, put that magnet on. Now, one of three things is going to happen once you apply the magnet. If you see nothing, so nothing happens, no spikes, no, doesn't turn the pacemaker on, your pacemaker is dead. So that patient needs to get to an electrophysiologist. They need that pacemaker replaced immediately, or they need, you know, transcutaneous pacing in the interim if they're very symptomatic. Um, so if you get nothing happening when you put a magnet on a pacemaker, the pacemaker has died. If you put the magnet on and you start to see spikes, but the spikes are slow, so they're under 65 beats per minute, then it means that the battery is reaching the end of its life. And so the pacemaker is trying to preserve its battery life. And so it's not working as frequently as it should. If you put the magnet on and you get spikes that are at 85 beats per minute or higher or right around there, then something interfered with the pacemaker, usually again, over sensing. And now you've got the pacemaker back online again and all is well. So that's what's going to happen when you put a magnet on a pacemaker um, in the setting of bradycardia or failure to pace. Um, are there any questions up to this point before we move on to the next? 
problem we're going to encounter. So I don't see anything in the chat. Um, I'm cool. pretty sure uh, the state I know has a protocol for magnets uh, in pre-hospital settings. So okay. our, our state, so I think our medics do carry those. Perfect. Uh, others can chime in. I don't think that we have a protocol. We have a protocol around AICDs. I don't know that we have a protocol for pacemaker uh, malfunction. I know there are a number of providers uh, online and maybe they can put in the chat if we do. I don't think that we have. So this would require medical consultation for our program. Got it. Is my Got point. it. Got it. Cool. All right. So that's the magnet pacemakers and we're going to talk about magnet and ICDs as well. Okay, so the next um, most common um, issue that you will encounter with pacemakers. So you see this rhythm strip, and this is a patient with a dual chambered pacemaker. How do I know? This is an atrial spike. Here's the P wave. Here's the ventricular spike and this wide QRS complex. So dual chambered pacemaker looks like it's working well. Atrial spike, I get my normal P wave, ventricular spike, wide QRS. Atrial spike, this little P wave, ventricular spike, and then nothing happened after that. That's not good. Looks like this beat looks okay. So atrial spike, P wave, ventricular spike, QRS complex. Atrial spike, P wave, ventricular spike, nothing. And then atrial spike, P wave, ventricular spike, nothing. So it looks like the pacemaker's working and it's trying to pace. It's certainly firing appropriately but I'm not getting the response I'm supposed to from the heart. And so what this means is you've got failure to capture. And what capturing means is that the heart is not generating either the P wave or the QRS complex that it needs to in response to that spike from the pacemaker. So the pacemaker is delivering the stimulus, but the heart just isn't responding appropriately. And on the rhythm strip or on the EKG, you're going to see the pacer spikes but then you're not gonna see the P or the QRS complex um, immediately afterwards. Typically, this is going to be either an issue with electrolytes. So maybe their magnesium is off, their potassium is off, calcium, um, and that can make the myocardium slow to respond to the stimulus. If the patient is on digoxin, um, sometimes that can cause um, issues with the myocardium and the, the conduction um, system and the heart's ability to respond appropriately. If we suspect it's a class one agent uh, toxicity, then this is where um, we will um, go ahead and, and either request or give uh, sodium bicarb or 3% hypertonic saline. Ischemia, a huge um, reason why you might get failure to capture or the heart being unable to respond appropriately. Ischemic tissue is hard to conduct electricity through. So e even if the pacemaker is firing away that ischemic tissue, just is not recognizing that stimulus because the electricity is not conducting through it appropriately. And with, you know, we have a new generation of pacemakers that actually don't have any leads. Um, it basically looks like a little bullet that can sit in the right ventricle. But a, a very common problem um, in terms of failure to capture is if there's a problem with the lead, if the lead gets dislodged. So you can imagine if, if where the, the pacemaker lead is sitting, if it's not right up against where it needs to be, it can try to fire away all it wants. But if it's in the wrong location, the heart's not going to respond um, the right way. So that's why we're trying to move away from these pacemakers that have these pesky leads and lead issues. This is a fun. Um, this is a fun EKG. This one came into our emergency department. It took us a little bit of time to figure out what was going on here. So this was a lady who's got um, a pacemaker, and she came in as a syncopal episode. Was very short of breath when she initially arrived. Um, and if you take a look at this twelve lead, you know the first thing that sticks out is you know this this rate looks pretty good to me. So I don't think this is a rate related syncope. Um, the QRS complex is, is wide the way I would expect in a patient who's got a, um, a ventricular pacemaker. But when you take a closer look, and this is why it's, it's important to really kind of look at these and see what's going on here. So I've got a, let's pick this one here. So I, I see a little pacer spike here and the, our EKG, our 12 lead EKG kind of marches out where the, the various spikes are happening. So I see there's a spike here. I'm assuming this is from where the 
uh, atrial spike happened. And then I've got this ventricular spike here. I'm not seeing a big spike, but it's give, giving me this QRS complex. And then I've got another kind of spike happening here. There's a spike here. There's, you know, and then when you look here, there's a spike in the middle of this T wave. There's a spike here too in the middle of a T wave. Like that should not be happening. I should not be seeing a pacemaker trying to pace in the middle of a T wave. That's very, very bizarre. And so we were trying to figure out why is this pacemaker confused and trying to pace on top of a T wave? It should be, you know, it should be right up here trying to either pace, you know, and generate a P wave. So why is it not seeing the T wave in the right, in the right location and then trying to pace on top of that? And so this is where the EKG, the chest X-ray became super duper helpful. So this is the normal location for a pacemaker ICD. It's usually put on the left side of the heart initially. Sometimes you'll see it if, if a patient is getting a revision of their pacemaker or ICD, they'll move it to the other side just because the tissue here kind of gets a little bit lax. But this is uh, the device. There are two leads here. So this is the ventricular lead and you can see it's coming all the way down here to the right ventricle. And this is actually not just a pacemaker, this is actually an ICD. And the way I can tell is it's got this thick white um, lead here into the, the ventricle. And that's how the, the electricity of how the defibrillation happens is through this white coil. The atrial lead, if you can imagine, the right atrium sits over here. So this is where the right atrium is and the right ventricles all the way down here. The right ventricular lead is in the right location, but the right atrial lead should be here, but it's not even in the heart right? Like this right atrial lead is like abutting the clavicle here. And so this is why the pacemaker was pacing inappropriately. That atrium, these atrial leads were coming in the middle of nowhere here in the middle of the T waves because it's just not in the right location. And so it's not picking up the, any normal P wave. So it's just trying to, to fire away and see if it can generate some P waves somehow, but it's never going to make it out here by the clavicle. And so this is an example of twiddler syndrome. Um, and this is where patients will sit and they will manipulate their pacemaker or their ICD. They'll basically, you know, play with the device. Um, and we tend to see this more in kids who have devices or sort of elderly um, thin women who don't have a lot of subcutaneous tissue to kind of anchor the generator in their chest wall. And so what they can do is they can sit and literally twiddle the device. They can play with it, twist it around. And so as it gets twisted, and you can see these leads have twisted around the generator and it's yanked on this, um, this atrial lead so that it's no longer in the right location. And so chest X-ray is how we can make this um, diagnosis very quickly. And so we ended up calling our electrophysiologist. They were able to come in and just turn off the atrial lead so that it was only the ventricular lead that was working for the patient. And then the next day they were able to just revise the, the device for her so that um, it was then in the right location. All right. And then our third problem with pacemakers um, is going to be failure to sense. And what this is, is um, this is where the pacemaker fails to recognize normal P waves or normal QRS complexes. So for whatever reason, it's not able to run surveillance appropriately. And so it's just not seeing normal activity. And so if you take a look at this 12 lead EKG, um, you can see that you've got a QRS complex here, and then you've got this ventricular spike after the normal QRS complex. So for whatever reason, this ventricular pacemaker didn't see the QRS complex and it's like, oh my God, I don't see a QRS complex, fire, fire. And so it's trying, but you know, the, the heart is in a refractory period here. It's not gonna be able to make a normal QRS. So this is a wasted uh, ventricular spike and it does it again. It just keeps repeatedly trying to pace and generate a ventricular uh, beat and it's not seeing the normal QRS complex. So this is failure to sense. This is uncommon. You're not gonna see this um, very often. It's uh, the pacemaker just fails to see the normal cardiac activity and you're going to see pacer spikes despite a normal P wave or a normal QRS complex. And so you can see there's just, this is a normal P wave, this is a normal QRS complex. And then you've got this random spike happening here for no good reason. And so we don't like this obviously because 
this is using battery power and it's using the, um, it's, it's shortening the lifespan of the device. And so this, we, we need to fix this right away. This is a fun one, a fun uh, 12 lead. So um, Todd Haber is an emergency physician down in Florida. He sent me this, um, this EKG. And what we see here is, so the first thing I look at here is this is pretty fast. So pacemakers are set to, to kind of fire in a certain range. So usually it's gonna be about like 65 to about 120. And when I take a look at this um, rhythm strip down here, this is running at about 150. So um, that's, that's too fast for, for a pacemaker. And what was happening here is you can see kind of, I don't some of these sometimes, here you can see when it's slowed down a little bit. This is atrial flutter um, out here. And it's very clear when the, when the rate's a little bit slower, but once it starts getting faster, it's a little hard to see those flutter waves. But these are the flutter waves here. And the flutter waves are running at about 150. So remember flutter, you know, this is a two to one conduction. Um, and the pacemaker is doing its darndest to try to keep up with those flutter waves. So the flutter waves are going really, really fast. And so the pacemaker is like, oh my God, I see a P wave, fire, fire, fire. Um, and this is gonna make the patient very, very uncomfortable. And so essentially what they did was they revised the pacemaker um, and they were then able to get it to stop seeing all the, uh, the flutter waves. And so they were able to just get it to slow down and pace at a normal rate. So it basically turned some of the sensing function off so that it doesn't see all those flutter waves. This is a good one too. So this was a, um, an older lady who came in. Um, she had a history of paroxysmal AFib. Um, she has an atrioventricular pacemaker. So you can see because there's two, there's always two spikes. So you've got, um, here's your atrial spike, here's your ventricular spike and a wide QRS complex. Now, for whatever reason, this atrial spike is happening at the end of the T wave. That's not normal. The pacemaker is smarter than that. So it should have waited a certain amount of time and then you know the atrial spike should have come around here. Um, because the atrial and ventricular spike came too early, the heart is in a, in a refractory period. It's not gonna be able to respond appropriately. So nothing happens, it fires again. So here's your atrial spike, a ventricular spike, nice wide QRS complex. And then you know again, it's firing inappropriately during the refractory period. So not only is the, is the pacemaker not only does it have failure to sense in that it's not recognizing like there's a T wave, you don't need to be firing on top of a T wave, but it's also not able to capture either because you can see there's nothing happening afterwards. So this is failure to sense and failure to capture. And this heart rate, I mean, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven legitimate QRS complexes. So this heart rate is about 42. Um, and that the patient was very, very symptomatic of this. And this is another one. So um, this is a good one that Todd, Todd Haber sent um, as well. And so this is an example of a pacemaker that's running way too fast. So again, we, we talked about the pacemaker should be running anywhere from about 65 to about 120. And this is, this is way, way faster than that. And so the pacemaker is going too quickly. Um, and so what would cause this, this is a great example of pacemaker mediated tachycardia. And this is a re-entrant tachycardia where the pacemaker is part of the re-entrant circuit. And so the good news is that the maximum heart rate that the patient is going to be able to achieve is usually not going to exceed the upper limit of the pacemaker. So if, if the cardiologist set the upper limit of the pacemaker at 150, it's not gonna go up above 150. Um, and this is usually caused either by a PVC that happens that then generates this re-entrant loop or sometimes we do this, if we put a magnet on the patient when we remove the magnet, um, in the process of removing the magnet, we can um, end up causing pacemaker mediated tachycardia. And the patient's going to come in symptomatic of this. They're gonna be like, I have palpitations, I don't feel well. And the good news is, is that once you put the magnet on, it should stop this. So that'll stop it right away. And so we have a cure for pacemaker mediated tachycardia. What we don't have a good solution for is runaway pacemaker. So runaway pacemaker is a true, true emergency. And um, unfortunately, you can certainly try to put the magnet on a runaway pacemaker. Now you're gonna see rates that can exceed you know, 200, 300. I think the 
highest documented runaway pacemaker rate is in the 700s. And obviously that's not compatible with life. So this is a true generator malfunction. The rate is gonna be way above the upper limit of the pacemaker. This can then degenerate to V-fib or V-tac. And really our only solution is to cut the wire. The magnet is not going to work in this in this situation. So this is this is one of those scenarios where you're like, man, I hope this never happens <laughs> on my shift because um, I am not looking to open up a patient's chest and cut their wires. This is like you know the movie Speed. Um, so and I just dated myself. I just realized. Um, so yeah. So this is the only way that you can you can really cure runaway pacemaker is to just cut the wires. And usually they're going to. Um, degenerate into V-fib, and that's going to be the way that you're going to um, uh, be able to, to resolve that. So we talked a little bit about um, when you're going to use a magnet in pacemakers. We talked about bradycardia and failure to pace, and the three responses that you will get in that scenario, either no spikes, um, which means the pacemaker um, is dead, the spikes will be slow, so less than 65 beats per minute, which tells you that the battery is reaching the end of its lifespan, or it'll just reset back to its normal rate, which means something had interfered with the pacemaker, and now it should be fine once you put the magnet on. And then pacemaker-mediated tachycardia is another scenario where the magnet can be very helpful. So that's really the, the two scenarios that you're going to end up using a magnet in a pacemaker. Um, in the interest of time, we're not going to talk about search hysteresis because that's um, a little over the top. But all right, here we go. Let's switch a little bit to ICDs. Um, for the end of a question. Yeah, yeah. So somebody asked, um, uh, are the electrical voltages so small in internal pacing that the patient doesn't feel it or do they feel it? So it depends on the patient. Some are very sensitive and they can tell when their pacemaker is working, when their pacemaker is online and some don't. So it's really, really dependent on the patient. The, the, the voltages are very, very low, um, but some people are just more in tuned with, with their body and they can tell when the pacemaker is working. Uh, we certainly cannot tell by touching the patient or you know listening or whatever, you're not gonna be able to tell, but sometimes the patient can, yeah they can tell when their pacemaker is working. Um, okay, ICDs. ICDs are pretty amazing. Um, so ICDs are cardioverter defibrillator. And the way these work is they're basically looking for VTAC or VFib. Um, we're, just, we're just gonna keep it simple. And they're gonna try to resolve VTAC or VFib in one of three ways. The first thing they're gonna to try to do is anti-tachycardic pacing, which is over, um, overdrive pacing. And so they basically take the patient's heart rate, whatever it's going at, so VTAC running at 200, and they're going to ramp up the rate to you know, 210 or 220. So typically it's like 10 to 20 beats per minute higher than what the patient is running. And then they will then drag that heart rate down to a normal um, to a normal rhythm and a normal rate. That's a low energy phenomenon. So the ICD doesn't have to exert a lot of energy to do that. If that fails, they will then try to cardiovert. So the device will then try to cardiovert. And then if that fails, then it will go to defibrillation. So it saves defibrillation for the end just because that's a high energy um, phenomenon and it's really trying to preserve its battery life by using the low energy stuff first. The last thing that a, an ICD is able to do is to pace bradycardia. So not only can it sort of end VTAC and VFib, but it can also pace any bradycardia. Now, I always said, I'm going to hit a certain age and I'm really going to want one of these um, put in me, whether I need it or not. Um, so I'm going to show you a really fun video. Now, it's a little bit grainy um, because I had to pull it off of, um, off of YouTube. This is a soccer player in Europe who um, uh, has, I'm not sure if he has WPW or if he's got Brugada syndrome. His cardiologist happens to be the good Dr. Brugada. Um, and so I, I'm not sure if, if that's why, uh, um, why he sees Dr. Brugada. He's right here. He just drops. Watch his legs. Look here. Boom. And he's up. 
and we've seen, you know, we've heard all of these stories, these like nightmare stories of like young athletes who suddenly drop dead on basketball courts, on, um, on soccer fields like this. Um, and, you know, this guy's obviously super lucky and somebody had identified this um, in the past, gave him an ICD, but, you know, this could have ended up so, so tragically of a, of a young soccer player, you know, just collapsing on the field and then getting carted off um, and would have been just absolutely tragic. Um, he's got his device and uh, you know, got, got defibrillated in the middle of a match and um, sat right up. Um, so it's just, these devices are just amazing. Um, so what does a magnet do in an ICD? And this is sometimes we get confused with when am I supposed to use a magnet um, in a pacemaker and when, I, when I'm gonna use it in an ICD. So remember it in a pacemaker, when we put the magnet on the pacemaker, we said it turns the sensing function off. And by turning the sensing function off, you're turning off its surveillance. It's not going to recognize abnormal rhythms. And so in a pacemaker, it tells the pacemaker to start pacing. In an ICD, if you turn the sensing function off, then you're not going to recognize, the device is not going to recognize VTAC or VFib. The problem with the device not recognizing VTAC or VFib is that it will not defibrillate, defibrillate VTAC or VFib. So in effect, by turning the sensing function of an ICD off, you are also turning off the therapy of the device. And so this is the critical thing you have to remember before you put a magnet on a device is, does the patient have a pacemaker or do they have an ICD? Because if you put that magnet on a patient who has an ICD, you have turned off their life-saving device. And now you better be prepared to externally cardiovert or externally defibrillate that patient because the device will no longer work. So it's very different. In a pacemaker, when you put the magnet on, it's gonna fire up the pacemaker. With an ICD, when you put that magnet on, you are suppressing the ability of the ICD to cardiovert or defibrillate VTAC or VFib. So you will have to do that. So make sure you've got those pads on before you put the magnet on an ICD. So I hope that's very clear because this gets a little confusing. Magnets and ICDs, we're going to use that really in one of two scenarios. One is if I see the patient gets an inappropriate shock in my emergency department. So they're in front of me, I've got them on the monitor, everything looks good. And for whatever reason, the ICD de decided to defibrillate them or cardiovert them, which is very uncomfortable for the patient. I'm going to put the magnet on because I don't want the device to do that. Okay, it's inappropriate. I want to make sure I turn the device off or if I'm going to take over defibrillation or cardioversion in a cardiac arrest, then I'm gonna put the magnet on because I don't want the ICD interfering with what I'm doing. So those are really the only two scenarios where we put a magnet on an ICD. If I'm taking over the cardiac arrest and I wanna control when the patient is getting defibrillated, or if I immediately see it in my ED that they're getting an inappropriate shock. The ICD is kind of cool. When you put the magnet on, it makes a sound and it's audible. You can hear it. So when you put the magnet on, it's going to give you like a 10 second continuous tone. And that's telling you like, yo, you just turned me off. You better be ready to do what needs to be done. If you put the magnet on and you get the sound of like a truck that's backing up. So it's like, um, you know, beep, beep, beep. That's, that's a low urgency alarm. It's telling you like, hey, heads up, something happened at some point. I had to do some anti-tachycardic pacing recently, I had to cardiovert recently, um, you may want to interrogate me. If you get that French police car um, alarm, so it's like, that's a high urgency alarm. Um, there's something wrong with the ICD. And so we will then um, call the electrophysiologist to come in and, um, and do an elect, uh, do a interrogation and figure out what's going on with the device. So two scenarios only where we use a magnet on an ICD. So really what you want to do is when you take a look at a, a rhythm strip or an EKG, take a look at the rate. Is it slow? Is it normal? Is it fast? In a pacemaker, it should really never be slow. Um, you should never really be dropping below 60. Is it too fast? It really shouldn't be above like 120. Um, and so those are pacemaker issues um, if you're seeing it too slow or too fast. 
Are you seeing pacer spikes or not? Um, if you're not seeing them, should you be seeing them? So if the heart rate's 30, I should be seeing some pacer spikes. So if I'm not seeing it, then I know that there's failure to pace. Am I seeing P's or QRS complexes after every spike? If I'm not, then I've got failure to capture. And then lastly, are the spikes appropriate? So did the patient really need the, the spike to be generated or is the pacemaker trying to pace despite there being a normal P wave or a normal QRS complex? Then that's failure to sense. A few practical pearls, don't put external pads directly over the device. These are super expensive devices and trying to cardiovert or defibrillate through the device is going to damage the device. And so we don't want to do that. So try to set the pads off away from the device. If you are intubating, we talked about, um, you know, if you have to use a paralytic succinylcholine will cause those fasciculations and that can then um, lead to failure to pace. So use non-depolarizing paralytic agents like rocuronium. If you have a really obese patient, you may actually need two magnets. So if you need to put a magnet on an obese patient who has a pacemaker or ICD, sometimes you need two magnets. So we just stack them on top of each other, put it over the device and tape the magnets to the patient. If you're pronouncing a patient and they have a pacemaker or an ICD, think about turning off the monitor, um, especially if there's family or anybody around, they get confused when they see the pacer spikes, they think there's electrical activity and that can be kind of distressing when we're pronouncing. So just turn off the monitor so they don't see those random pacer spikes. Um, and yeah, turn off the ICD um, after you pronounce the patient. So put the magnet on and turn off that device. This is a cool app. I have zero um, invested in this particular app. Um, but if you, if you are ever in a setting where they do get x-rays and you're able to, to take a look at that x-ray, you just basically um, hover your camera of your smartphone over the um, image of the device in the chest wall and it spits out the device manufacturer and how certain the app is that that's who manufactured it. And that's helpful in terms of trying to, um, if you have to call the interrogator in to interrogate the device. And that's gonna wrap it up for me. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. Um, that's my Twitter um, handle and that's my email. I'm also ha happy to answer emails if anybody's feeling shy and doesn't want to speak up here. What great content. Thank you so much. Thank you Thanks for great. spending your Thursday evening with me. Oh my gosh, so fun. Uh, somebody asked, is there a time lag to normal operation once you remove the magnet from an ICD that was malfunctioning? Immediate, immediate. And the newer devices, so probably in the, and by new, I mean in the last decade. So it used to be that if we put a magnet on the device, we had to call the interrogator to come in and interrogate the device and make sure it's back online again and working properly. And now, you know, they've, those devices have evolved. So you know, if you put the magnet on and you take it off, the device is right back um, to where it was before. So no need to get it reinterrogated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The new innovations are pretty amazing with the wireless devices. The wireless devices are are very very cool. One of our um, faculty members, so um, he uh, had just retired um, and opted to do a few volunteer shifts in the emergency department. Um, just so that he could, you know, st keep doing a few things. Um, and he got assigned to work a 7 a.m. Saturday shift, and he was not the happiest about that. And he came in grumbling, and he's like, I agreed to work um, shifts, but I didn't want it to be 7 a.m. on a Saturday. Grumble, 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 walks away. And um, about, you know, 15 or 20 minutes later, a pharmacist comes up the elevator from the back entrance and finds him in the hallway. Um, and he's collapsed in the hallway. And so they grab him, they throw him on the gurney, roll him into recess. He was in refractory V-fib. Um, he got defibrillated 10 or 15 times. I mean, they, this is one of our colleagues, we're gonna work him till, uh, until we can't work him anymore. And so he got everything, he got everything done. We got him back, um, he went up to the cath lab, Everything was completely normal in the cath lab. We still don't know what happened, but he now has one of those newfangled um, ICDs that's wireless. Um, and he's never had another event since, but, um, and then he really retired after that. He's like, I'm not coming back ever again. <laughs> that's an eye-opening moment for sure. 
<laughs> so yeah, he's doing great now, but uh, his devices are pretty cool. Well, I certainly formally want to thank you again. I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>